Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today, we're chatting with Naomi G, an expert in clear messaging, copywriting, and visual branding, who specifically loves working with health and wellness coaches. Learning how to tell your story is a clutch part of branding that frankly, nobody likes doing or feels is worth the time and energy. While it is worth the time and energy, it's gosh darn essential. In this conversation, Naomi walks us through a website audit that you can do on your own website right now to make sure that it's communicating to your audience in the way that online audiences desire to be communicated with. To be honest with you, Naomi gives away a ton of actionable messaging tips and tricks in this episode, ideas and concepts that you can put into play right away and start really hooking your audience with your messaging. Our show's sponsor is Primal Health Coach Institute. We're a health coaching school that provides aspiring and existing health and fitness professionals with the training resources and support to make a lucrative living changing lives. We've got thousands of graduates practicing unique coaching specialties and changing lives in countries all over the world. Visit primalhealthcoach.com to learn about all of our coaching and specialty certifications, including the Primal Health Coach Certification Course the Primal Fitness Coach Certification Course, and our Master Coach Certification Course that satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the Health Coaching National Board Exam. We're in the process of launching several specialty courses so existing coaches from any school can earn specialty education in topics like strength training for women, the human intestinal microbiome, functional therapeutic diets, or health coaching in medical practices. Enrollment is open as well for our 12-week hands-on business coaching program. Our Launch Your Coaching Business course will nurture you to create and sell your signature health coaching program. We have a lot going on, so keep checking back to our website and sign up to our email list to be the first to find out when these outstanding new courses are open for enrollment. Visit PrimalHealthCoach.com and check it all out. As you're listening to today's show, make sure to screen grab your podcast player and tag us in your Instagram stories at Health Coach Radio. And as always, the show notes for this episode and all previous shows can be found at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash radio. Get ready to take notes and to take action on this one, folks. Please welcome our guest, Naomi G. Hello, Naomi G. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. We love talking to people who love helping health coaches. So we're excited to talk to you. Um, And you work in the realm of marketing and business, which is one of the biggest sources of insecurity for most health coaches trying to go to business. So this will be a good episode. Buckle up, everybody. So Naomi, tell us about you. Tell us, like, give us like the five minute, like origin story of Naomi. Okay. I could err on either way, being super short or being way long winded. So I'm going to try to hit your five minute mark. (laughs) Yeah. So I actually went to school for graphic design. So that's how my career started. And I worked for a number of years for different companies and eventually branched out onto my own and started honing in on branding. I really love helping people create their visual brands. And then eventually I became a story brand certified guide, which is a marketing focus and helping people create messaging for their brands and helping them clarify in a way that helps them connect with your customers and not say super self-focused because a lot of businesses do um, err on the side of talking about themselves. We know everything about ourselves. And so it's really easy to do. And instead I try to help people um, shift that focus and talk about their clients in a way that invites them into a story that they want to really be part of. Um, My passion for helping health coaches, wellness coaches, fitness coaches, and um, people who are just helping people along their health journey is fueled by my own um, health journey. I've always been an athlete. I did three sports all through high school and middle school and just loved being active. Went to college and I didn't do any sports, but I stayed really active. I joined you know, the city league volleyball teams and just continued to be, um, I, I went through a CrossFit phase, all of those things to stay healthy, not recognizing that I actually had no nutritional knowledge. I just 
I mean, I ate a lot of sugar. I ate a lot of tortillas and tortilla chips and, you know, and that was like my main two food groups. And so, um, flash forward to me having babies and the recovery from my first was very quick. I I was the like ideal jump back to my regular from whatever regular means body. But then I had a second and I got in a car accident early in my pregnancy and I wasn't able to exercise. And it was so discouraging to me that I didn't realize it while it was happening. But what I did was through all of my healthy habits out the window because I was so discouraged about not being able to exercise. Mm. So I just ate whatever I wanted all in the name of, you know, eating for two. (laughs) And I just, um, formed terrible habits. So a year postpartum, I still looked six months pregnant and I was really discouraged by that. And so, um, you know, it's hard to make a lifestyle change until you're mentally ready to really commit to something. And so at, at some point around the 12 to 13 months postpartum, my brain finally did it and just switched and said, listen, it's time. You need to start being healthy again. And thankfully I have a very supportive spouse who is not Mm -hmm. focused on my appearance. And I, so it was helpful that I was not like feeling the pressure externally to look how I used to look. And so I was able to really focus on how I felt. Was I feeling healthy? Was I being active in a way that I'm being an example to my kids? And through the journey of finding a health, nutrition, fitness coach to look to, I was finding a lot of health and nutrition coaches who looked like amateurs visually in their brand. And it made me click off of them really quickly as I was searching for someone to follow, because I was like, they just don't look like they know what they're doing yet. They look like they're just starting. And as I was doing this, I started to linger longer on some people's pages and realized they are actually experts. They're not amateurs at all, but their visual brand made my brain assume that they were. And so as I was searching, I started to grow this passion. Like I want to help these businesses in their visual and their message branding, because they could be helping so many more people if they showed up in that expertise that they actually already have. And so that's how my passion for helping this industry really started because I just want them to be found. I want someone like me to be able to easily find the right person for them to start them on their health journey or continue their health journey with them. And so Um, I mean, I could talk about all day. I just want these businesses to be able to be found by the people who really need them because it just took me so long to find the right person to like know, like, and trust so that I could join their program and feel good about what I was doing. So, yeah. Hmm. My gosh, Erin, both of our faces just lit up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, gosh, I, I really want to dive in and pick your brain about the last thing you just shared, which is some people look like like, I love how you put it. Some people look like amateurs. Some people look like experts. And it was it was sort of your customer experience of landing on their web page, website, that made you decide. And, and I, I truly believe that. I, I really believe one of, the, one of the sort of business pieces of advice that I give our coaches that we graduate from school is state your claim, declare yourself an expert in something and behave as though you are an expert in it because you are. I really don't like the sort of meek, I'm new, I'm just getting started language. But what you're talking about is the visual representation, the experience of, of having landed on their website. I'm just really curious if you can, off the top of your head, give us a couple of the, the sensations or the things that you saw that made it feel like this person is an amateur. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So visually speaking, some of the things that are really common are to um, stick with like your favorite colors, which let's be honest. Our favorite colors change all the time, even if we think that they don't, you know, I could look back to my childhood and say, yes, my favorite color has always been green, but I'll go through phases of loving yellow, loving pink, loving blue, you know? So a lot of times when we're feeling at a place of stagnation in our business, or we're feeling nervous about getting clients, or maybe we're just um, bored with the client work and we need a little mental break. We fiddle in our businesses and like change little things and tweak little things just because we're maybe sitting at our desk or on our phone and like want something to do. And so people will often move their colors around every six months, every year. And then it starts appearing inconsistently. And consistency is one of the biggest factors in showing up like an expert. If you're showing up consistently, and and this is across the board, this could be 
consistently showing up on social media. This could be consistency in your colors. This could be consistency in your email campaigns. This could be consistency in your check-ins with your clients. You know, consistency is just such a huge factor in our businesses, whether you're talking about branding like I do or any other aspect of business. And so um, colors are a big one that just if someone lands on your website or your social media, especially, and they start seeing random things that you've chosen off of Canva and your templates change every time based on your mood, then it's so inconsistent that the amateur factor starts peaking up. Or if they're just scrolling and they see your post, they don't know it's you because you haven't established a look and a feel Mm -hmm. to your posts. And that Um, obviously that's a little different when it's your face every time and they see your face in a reel or something like that. But if you're doing graphics and the colors are constantly changing, the fonts are constantly changing, then it's going to be really hard for somebody to scroll and just see your post scroll by and be like, oh yeah, I want to see that one because I know that account adds value to my life. I know those tips or those tricks or those motivations are helpful to me. Even if somebody thinks that about your account, if you if they can't spot you really quickly in their scroll, they're not going to stop and and take in what you're offering. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Is there, is there something else? I mean, the colors is interesting, but I just wonder if when you're when you're visiting websites, if it's if there's something in the language. Is there yes. any language cues that you pick up? Yeah. Messaging is so huge. It's really easy for a personal brand like a coach to get on their website. And the first thing someone says is, hi, I'm Naomi. I help you with your branding. <laughs> and you know that might be really interesting and that might be what they actually need. But there's a deeper problem. There's a deeper issue that somebody is trying to fix if they're searching for someone like me or if they're searching for a health coach. Maybe they have diabetes and they want somebody who's specifically focused on that. Or maybe they're postpartum like I was and they want someone who gets it, who's been there before and who understands what I'm going through as a new mom. You know, maybe it's someone who wants to get onto their college sports team and they're in their their junior year of high school and they want to find that coach that you know is going to help them stay healthy through that process and get to that goal. And so uh, when you get to a website, you know, I like to tell people to do a grunt test and this is a great way to evaluate if your messaging is on point before you ever scroll. So when you get to a website, here's what I want to see. Your first line should address one of two things, either the problem that you solve or the identity someone might aspire to if they hire you. So imagine you take someone on a journey before they work with you, they're at point A. And after they work with you, they've had the successful point B that they've reached. So I want to point out the point B that they could be. So, you know, if it's that person who has diabetes, it could be, you know, live insulin injection free, you know, so something like that is something that if I have diabetes and I'm looking for a health coach, I'm like, yes, I'm so tired of insulin injections. I want this person understands what I'm looking for. Or if it's a problem that you solve, maybe that person is tired of managing um, their insulin. So, so Mm -hmm. stop Stop stressing about your insulin. And then you can dig in deeper to what you do and who you are down the road. But you have just pulled them in and made them understand that you know where they're coming from in their journey. And so does that make sense in in what I'm saying needs to be there first? So when I'm talking about the grunt test that I mentioned a second ago, open your website up and it's a really easy way for you to evaluate Is this saying what it needs to say in a very clear way to my audience? Take it to your neighbor, you know, take it to church and show it to a random person you never met before at a coffee shop or down, you know, to your kid's soccer game, wherever you're going, show it to someone who doesn't know anything about your business. Open your website up and show them the landing page just before scrolling, like exactly what I just talked about, that first section, and then close it down after five to eight seconds. And ask them, what do I do? If they cannot answer you, then you need to start clarifying your message a little bit more. Because if somebody can't answer after five or eight seconds looking at your website, then it means that that we need some more clarity because your audience isn't going to understand either. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. I love that. And how, how like clear and clean that is, right, Aaron? I mean, we, in our 
we do some business training in our course. And this is, these are the first two exercises we help people identify is who do you, what problem do you solve? Because if you can't solve Mm -hmm. a problem that people are willing to pay to solve, you don't have a business. Um, But also you have to be clear about who you serve, right? So these are the first, but we use different terminology, right? Aaron, we really kind of get into, you know, who's your target. We don't necessarily always think in terms of who does your target want to be. So that's an interesting twist to that. Yeah. I think it's important. I mean, I was just talking about this in a webinar I led yesterday. It's like when I get up to teach a yoga class, I'm not going to say this is a yin yoga class. Yin does this and is this, and, and this is what yin is all about. People don't give, people don't care what yin yoga is about. They're here <laughs> to know what's going to happen in their body when they do it. Right. Mm-hmm. So what I think is interesting about this and what really I felt a little triggered by which is good. It's a good thing to feel triggered is when somebody opens my <laughs> website, they're going to see my tagline, achieve an effortless relationship with food. I, if they looked at it for five to eight seconds and then close it down, I don't know if they would be able to, <laughs> if they would know what I do. I, yeah. I was like, Ooh, that's a good point. Cause it felt so aspirational. It feels like, Ooh, that's going to grab someone's attention, but they have to be able to relate it to their own experience. Right. That that's the thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So you know what I would bit. suggest if, yeah. if you're so close like that, you've had the aspiration, but it's not quite clear enough. What I would suggest is underneath it, have a little bit of subtext, not a paragraph, but like a one sentence thing that says something. And I'm not super clear on what you do, but I'm just going to give an example, nutrition coaching for whoever you serve. And that, I mean, then you can keep the headline you have. It's so aspirational and it, and it makes sense. And it's clear the industry that you're in, but then that subtext is just going to give a little bit more clarity to make sure somebody's like in the right spot. Cool. I like that. And the reason why I brought that up and just use mine as an example is because I think I, I see a couple of problems and I know you do too. So first of all, you, you touched on the first thing, which is the health coach who's, whose website is about me. Here's, yeah. me, <laughs> here's my story. Here's what I like to do. And it's like, And then there's the person who maybe goes a little bit too pie in the sky, dreamy with their kind of this esoteric language that is aspirational, but not clear, clever, but not clear, I guess. Yes. The the thing. So we have to kind of strike this balance and be like pragmatic. Like, let's make sure this person in five to eight seconds knows what you do. And if you have the solution to their problem, which is kind of what Laura was speaking to. Yes. I call that cleverness. I call that cute, but forgettable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the grunt test. So that's step one. Is there, is there yes. more to this? So here's another thing um, that I'll be honest, I can't remember the original question, but what Aaron just said has me thinking of the next piece of clarity that I really want to emphasize. And that's your call to action button. Mm-hmm. A couple of things that people do wrong in their call to action button. The first thing is that they don't have one. <laughs> they might have it once in the top of their website. And then they, as people scroll, it never shows up again. And so uh, that button is your cash register. So imagine, you know, you're, you walk into the department store, you've gathered, you know, a new crock pot, you've got some clothes in your arm, you might have grabbed a pair of shoes and you are searching for a cash register and you can't find it anywhere. And you find an employee and you say, where do I check out? And they're like, oh, head over to the women's bathroom. It's the third stall. <laughs> I'm Nobody is going to go into the women's bathroom with their crock pot and their clothes and their shoes. They're just going to drop it and be like, I'm out. Like, there, nobody, nobody's going to look for that because they don't want to take the effort. And what one thing about our, excuse me, about our businesses is that we need to be helping people survive and thrive. And in those efforts, we need to understand that in order to survive and thrive, we as humans burn mental calories, trying to figure out, does this piece of information help me survive and thrive? If it doesn't, I'm ignoring it because I only want to burn mental calories on the things that help me survive and thrive. So if we're going to make people burn all these mental calories to find our cash register, that call to action button, then they're going to check out and go to somebody's website. Who's much easier to understand. So that's the first thing, put that call to action button almost to the point where you feel like a broken record because to the audience, it does not feel like a broken record. So The other thing about calls to action are that they're very vague. Things like learn more or be inspired or read more. Those are extremely vague calls to action. And they don't actually tell someone, I'm confident enough that I'm going to ask you to buy for me. What it does 
like in the back subconscious of our brain is tell someone, I'm not confident enough to ask you to buy for me. I'm not sure my services are going to help you. So why don't you check out a few other websites and maybe you can learn more later. (laughs) So we want to be really confident in what we're selling. If you're a health coach and you have expertise in your industry, be confident in that stand in your coach and know that you have something to offer your clients. And so be bold and say, schedule a call, join my program, register now. Those are really clear calls to action where somebody knows this is the next step that I can take in my journey with this company. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I never really thought about that. I mean, you're right. Learn more is like, all right, if I click here, where's that going to take me? What am I going to do? It, it, you're, it take, kind of takes you off that, that main, like, like do something, Yeah. And, you know, whether, so, so I love the idea of, um, you know, book a call now or register now for more information, something that's more, more actionable. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about book a call as a call to action for, for a coach who does like a discovery call? Is that good? Yeah. I absolutely, because it's an actual step and it leads to a, an actual touch point with the person, which is face to face or voice to voice at, at least. And I mean, that's my call to action on my website. I'm pretty sure <laughs> I, should probably, <laughs> I should probably check that. I think it says schedule a call. Um, but I think that it's an absolutely great call to action because if you need to do some discovery, some digging to make sure you're a good fit for this client, because that's what health coaches have, their clients. We're not selling tangible products or most health coaches are not. Maybe there's a course or something like that. But if it's a service-based business, like most coaching is booking a call is the realistic next step to really know we're going to work well together. We're going to be a good fit, or I have some recommendations for you for some other way to go because most people are not going to want to waste time with clients who just are not a good fit. So if you immediately say sign up and you book this client before ever talking to them, you might really regret that. Yeah. I don't know. I've been rethinking that because we had a guest on who was a guest we had on, right, Laura, that said, uh, I don't do discovery calls. People who come to my website already know that they want to work with me. They already know they're a good fit because I'm so clear in my marketing messages. And that kind of got my wheels turning too. Imagine if the call to action was work with me and the, the button went to the checkout page and there was no discovery. And it's like, I wonder, I, I was an experiment. I would just have to try that to be honest with you. Just see yeah. what happens. You know, I think you bring up a really good point because there may be different phases of where people are in their business journey. If you're just starting out and you're still clarifying what it looks like to work with you, then schedule a call is is absolutely the best thing to do. But if you've been in business for five, 10, 20 years, and you have a market where like, you know, that your people get you, you've got this flourishing Facebook group or this amazing Instagram or TikTok account. And you know that your people are coming to you well revved, ready to go. They know who you are. Then I think that the other guests that you had on might be onto something that that might be obvious for their business that Mm -hmm. I'm at a point where I have so much traffic that these people already know they want to work with me. So I'm going to skip the step of a discovery call. It's a good problem to have, right? Absolutely. I'm going to ask you kind of like a, because there's people that go back and forth in terms of on your website, should our pricing be on the website or is the answer like many things, it depends (laughs) on the situation because for you know, we've had a lot of experts that say no they should book a call to work with you that that throwing a price out there without any context around the value of what you offer will you know versus just the idea of clarity look if the price tag off the bat is too expensive or these people aren't willing to find out more after looking at that i'm not sure that a discovery call is worth either of our time so do you have any opinions about that Yeah, I have a couple of opinions about that. So first off, um, I've tried it both ways for myself. And I think it's worth everybody trying it both ways for themselves. There's three ways to do it. You could have a set price, like this package is this price, this many months of coaching is this price or whatever your packages are. Or you could have a range. This many months is from this to this. You know, This is $1,000 to $3,000 depending on the services I'm offering for you specifically as a client. So then the discovery call is going to be important to hone in what that actual price is. But at least they have a range. Mm -hmm. Or you have no price at all and it just says book a call. And if you have no price at all, I always, actually, I suggest this no matter what you have on your website, prices or no prices, have an intake form. If somebody says book a call, have a form that they fill out 
as part of booking a call and in there have price ranges. If you, none of your packages are less than $500, start there, say 500 to $1,500, 1500 to $2,500 or whatever your range is. If none of your packages are under $3,000, don't have a range that's lower than $3,000. And that is going to filter people out. They're filling out that form and they see that your range doesn't go down to zero. <laughs> okay. Maybe this person is not, I'm not ready to hire them. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And then you're not having to get on calls with people who they have no idea. And, and for my discovery calls, I say, Hey, I see you have the range of X to X. Um, do you have a specific point in that range? That's like a more specific budget that you have. And if somebody does, they'll say it. If they don't, they'll be like, uh, not really. I'm not sure. And that says two things to me. Either they have a huge budget and it's the top of the range and they just don't want to commit to it because they hope your price is less, which is fine. (laughs) Or that's not actually their range and they don't want to pay yet. They just wanted to pick your brain about something, which happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so it's just up to us as the service provider to be discerning in a phone call and understand where that client is coming from. And I always err on the side of giving value instead of trying to just get people through the door and through the funnel and go through the the motions. I want to add as much value as possible. So my discovery calls are only 15 minutes, but I try to pack as much in as I can. So I ask a lot of questions on my intake form. You know, the the contact form on my website might have three questions, but if somebody says book a call with me, they're going to get about 10 or 15 questions because they're making the effort to say, I actually want to talk to you in person. So does that make sense that there's, if they're willing to fill out this form, there must be some value that they really are seeking. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's great. Yeah, I like that. Okay, let's move back to the grunt. Uh, by the way, why is it called that? The grunt <laughs> test. The so this grunt test is something that I mentioned. I was a story brand certified guide earlier, and the story brand community is um, is the one who came up with the grunt test. Um, and what that means is just. If a caveman, remember those old commercials, so easy a caveman could do it. (laughs) It kind of stems from that thinking. Like if somebody who knows nothing about your business looks at it, will they be able to go, uh, I get it, you know? (laughs) And so that's where that name comes from. Okay. I love it. All right. We have, um, we have the above the fold sort of tagline. We have the call to action. So both of these things should be front and center. Mm-hmm. Right, and then also the the call to action that sh- that button should be sprinkled throughout as as they scroll. What else do you look for? Yeah, um, I like to have a value stack right under my. Um, I, I love the words you used above the fold. If we talk in those old newspaper terms, um, before the scroll above the fold. So mm-hmm. right after that amazing headline. And let's backtrack for a second. Our brain reads that um, first part of a website before you scroll in a Z formation. So often I will encourage people to have that top left be your logo. The And then they scan across to the top right. And I want a call to action button right there. Then they come across where that's where it talks about like you help people thrive in their food journey or whatever that um, problem being solved is that you're saying, and then a call to action immediately under it. So you're going to have two before the scroll. And then as they're, they've come down to the bottom, right? I like to have three pieces of value that it adds. And a lot of times they're not tangible value, you know, stop stressing about food, be confident in your body. Stop. Um, I can't think of a third one, but you see where I'm going with this. You know, the the pieces of value that they're not tangibles that we're giving people, but the intangibles that somebody's going to walk away with feeling or understanding, you know, um, for some reason it comes to mind, like a financial advisor might say, like, understand your money, be confident in your financial trajectory, you know, things like that. Those, those intangible things that we can't really, um, put a label on, but that, we're going to try and describe to people as more value that they're going to get besides just, Mm -hmm. I'm going to coach you nutrition. Right. So. Yeah. Nobody really is looking for, I just don't think people are looking for nutrition coaching. I've got a friend who's a nutrition coach and that's how they market themselves. Like, Hey, do you need help with your nutrition? And it's like, (laughs) uh, how do people, how do people know if they need help with their nutrition? So Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good point because until I joined the program I joined, which was both a fitness and a macro tracking program. And before I joined that, I did not realize the lack of nutrition understanding that I had. Mm 
mm-hmm. until I was already in the program. And I started getting this content of education. And I thought, oh my goodness, I know nothing. So it's very interesting what you say about um, people not necessarily knowing their niche where somebody might think my niche is people who need nutrition coaching, but really their niche might be the people who need to use food in a better way or need to better their mindset around food or kick unhealthy food, you know, um, habits to the curb or, you know, things like that might be more tangible or intangible really things. Yeah. Like the, the client's experience of nutrition. What is that? Yeah. Like, what is that? Yeah. It's interesting. You bring up the, the Z shape thing. Cause yes. that takes me all the way back to my very first job out of school. I'm not going to get into it, but I learned that. And actually it was more of like a, a capital F, right? So it's like, you come up, you go across and then you'll go down and a little bit there and then mm-hmm. it tails down. It's, but every, most of the viewing happens along the left edge mm-hmm. over to the right. Anyways, it, it totally brought me back. It's like, but little things like that, you know, that I think they're more impactful than we think they are. And I, th- I think a lot of times now in the golden age of like entrepreneurship, which is what I think what we're in right now, and you can, you can go and get a Squarespace web set website template, and you can move the buttons anywhere you want to your heart's desire. Yeah. But there is actually science to this. Yeah, absolutely. Or one thing I see a lot in the health and wellness space is that there's just an inspirational photo before scrolling. And yeah. very little else. There might not even be words. There might not even be a menu yet <laughs> until you scroll. And um, the, uh, on those pages, my gut says, is this a photographer? Right. Yeah. Because I'm so confused about where I've landed. And so um, there's so many things that we can improve about how our web presence shows up because it's one of the top six reasons businesses fail is that their website presence, not just their website, but their online presence in its entirety is not consistent and expert looking. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for businesses like this, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when, when Brad and I were looking for a place to store an RV, I really, did. I was more, I was more worried <laughs> about like the price and the location. I couldn't have cared less how fancy their website was, you know? Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. But for a business like this, whether it's fitness coaching, health coaching, um, anything where it's service related and that you truly have to build trust, like people are literally putting, at least in their minds, their health in our hands, where really we're helping them take the health back and, and to hold it in their own hands. But at the end of the day, they really need to trust you. And, you know, one of the things we try to encourage our graduates to do is to just get out there. Yes, the website's important. You're going to get there. But at the end of the day, you need to get out there, get something up there. And then we can, you know, you can focus on things. But to, to Aaron's point, a lot of these templates are probably built that way for a reason you know, um, that are, that are out there to kind of get something up and running. But, um, what we don't want to do is discourage health coaches from getting out there before their website is perfect. But at the same time, there are some things that are important that, you know, cover these basic things and you're probably good in terms of, you know, that, um, that headline being really important. And and we, we talk all the time about, you know, they learn in their coaching training about how important tagging to your client's values are. And if you know your end client pretty well, you probably know <laughs> what the big ones are. And throwing that up on their website, I think, tells them that. Yeah. And I love the, the, the make that call to action button and action, because that's what we tell our coaches. Like the only thing that's going to make you successful is for you to actually get out there and do something. And the same thing holds true for your clients. And so to continue yep. to put that front and center book a call, book a call or, or whatever it is. Um, now one thing that we also talk about is having some sort of lead magnet. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited because I was just about to ask or, um, comment about this. So your call to action is really important. And we've talked about that a lot already, but let's liken it to marriage. (laughs) That call to action is a big commitment that somebody Mm -hmm. is about to make to you. So if somebody's not ready to marry you, then let's ask them on a date first. And so we, I like to call this a transitional call to action. So it's something that's, it's much more, um, low key. It's not as committal, but it will get you an email address so that person can get on your email thread and then you can start marketing to them a bit more. And that is your opt-in. That's your freebie, whatever it is. And we call it a freebie, but in reality, we're exchanging it for an email address, which in our human brains 
is about worth five to eight dollars. So it needs to have enough value in that. It cannot be vague and fluffy and like inspirational. It has to actually have value that somebody can walk away saying, I learned something impactful. I have tangible things to do now. I have a checklist of some sort, you know, something that somebody feels like this changed my life in a mi- minor way, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so did you have specific questions or would you like me to ramble about opt-ins? <laughs> I'm grateful that you put a dollar value on it. That's, yeah. I, that's my favorite that's helpful. thing I've heard. Well, and because yeah. here's the thing. So I, there are things that have caught my attention in terms of a, a, a free opt-in that when I got it, I was like, oh, that's it. Even though I didn't pay for it. So like, you know, but yeah. to your point, if it's got the value of five to $8 to me, it makes sense that I was a little disappointed that it yeah. was clearly just a carrot and there was really not, not a real carrot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't bite into it. There was really nothing of value there. Yep. I do have a question. I do have a follow-up question though, because this is what I go back and forth on. So when I think about like kind of Laura's anecdote, she just shared like the freebie that I want to give people would teach them lots of things mm-hmm. that like yes. theoretically they could download it and, and, and implement those things and be after the races. And I'd be very happy with that. Um, but I've also heard to me that then that's an ebook, right? That's a little, maybe a 10 page ebook. And I've also heard, well, people won't read a 10 page ebook. It needs to be a one pager. <laughs> and then I struggle because I don't know how to get an $8 value of information onto <laughs> one pager. Like I, it's right. that struggle. What do you have? Um, uh, what does your intuition tell you or your expert experience and more importantly tell you where do we land on that spectrum? Yeah. Um, so my first thing I want to say is page count doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Although I will say it should probably be more than one page because it should probably at least have a attractive cover that has a big headline that draws them in. So um, let's talk about headlines for just a second. It needs to be something that shows that it's valuable. So um, almost like it's not clickbait. You're actually adding value, but something that makes somebody think I have to click this. So whether it's like the five secrets, every nutritionist wants their clients to know. So obviously if I'm on a journey of health, I'm going to be like, yeah, what are the secrets? Like, what, (laughs) what am I missing? You know, or, you know, the, the 10 easiest foods to lower your cholesterol. You know, somebody might have that amazing, but the thing is, is that whatever you're putting in your opt-in, that value that you're, that you're pointing to in that headline, it should relate directly to your offer. So if you work with diabetics and you're talking about cholesterol, that's a huge disconnect, you know? So it needs to point directly to what you're actually trying to sell them later on in your marketing. And so that's the first thing is having a really catchy title. That's going to bring them in. The second thing is I so, so, so advocate having a workable PDF. So when I say that, I mean something that somebody has tangible to do's, whether it's a worksheet and, or a checklist or something that they can walk away feeling like I had more value than I thought I was going to get because I'm actually doing something with my hand or typing something, answering questions for myself and having to like do some work because I have this freebie. And so whether that's, the fact that you wrote a bunch of content and maybe the first line in your number one tip says most people struggle um, with how many carbs they're eating. And then your first question in your workbook section says, do you feel like you struggle with how many carbs you're eating? Yes or no. And they check. Yes. That physical or, you know, mental ability to check yes or no makes people think I have so much more value from this than I thought, because now they're having to evaluate themselves. And so I love to tell people to add in that actual working piece into their freebie because people can read and read and read a thousand PDFs, but until they're actually doing something, that value factor does not shoot up quite as high. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. I think about um, websites I've landed on where it's like, take the take the stress test or whatever stress questionnaire. And it's asking you, it's asking you questions about, you know, trying to gauge whether you are stressed. For example, I'm just using this as a complete random example. Yeah. I didn't actually like that experience. I didn't like checking these boxes and getting this diagnosis, like you're super stressed. You know, Mm. I didn't like that, but I think what could be interesting is more actionable. Like, like I would love an, an, a a lead maggot that's going to teach me something and then maybe you know, have me think through what my obstacles or my potential success rate, yeah. or, you know, like almost more 
more actionable rather than diagnostic. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm stuck yeah, with you that. gotta like, okay, so I'm super stressed, but then what? Like you have to yes. have a recommendation at the end of that. Okay. Yeah. So you rank X out of, you know, seven out of 10 on this stress scale. Here are some actionable things you can do. Exactly. You know, so to, to the person who has the stress test, I would definitely say, have a landing page for the one through threes, the four through sixes mm-hmm. that, you know, and for each of those ones, cater a landing page directly to that range in your stress test and have, these are some things that can help you. Here's a nightly routine. Here's a morning routine. Yeah, Here's, cool. you know, and so that somebody doesn't just leave thinking I'm super stressed. Thanks right. a lot. You know, that makes me more stressed, but instead they walk away with actionable things that they can do to help reduce that stress. So yes. maybe for someone who is struggling with their cholesterol they they walk away with the, you know, checklist of their grocery list, maybe even of like, here's some things that will help you manage your cholesterol when you go grocery ne- shopping next time. Or, you know, does that make sense of how, mm-hmm. even if your opt-in points to negative things, because sometimes that's the catchier headline, you always want to do the now what part of the yeah. opt-in. So for example, I tell people I'm actually about to post a blog post next week. That is about the four DIY design mistakes that are common among health coaches and how to avoid them. Yeah. Does that make, so we always want the, what if no, what now? I mean, so I do, I want to talk about that actually, but before we get to that, what was going through my head when you were explaining, Oh, have a separate landing page for each one is I know people listening right now are like, how the hell do I do that? I don't even know how to build one landing page. <laughs> how do I have all these different landing pages and set that up? So do you have some recommendations on either where a people can learn how or where they can find the expertise at a reasonable price for a startup to get something like that built? Or is that a two or 3.0 kind of opt-in? And maybe somebody just starting out should have something as simple as five key breakfasts that'll take you to lunch without needing a snack or something more. Yeah. So for the person just starting out, who's like, I am not building three separate landing pages. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I get it. Instead, you could have three separate downloads. Okay, if you are range one through three, this is your download. If you are range four through six, this is your download. If, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And they could just have PDFs ready to download for each of those. And to be honest, it's even more value because then no matter what range you get, you can see, oh, there's multiple downloads. I'm going to download all of them and just check them all out and see what's, what else is in this information. And then you're just building more and more trust as an expert in your field. And so the landing pages, absolutely. It sounds intimidating even to me sometimes. And so um, the one option is to just do PDFs. The next option is whatever email software you're using to have email campaigns, which if you don't already do that, sign up for an email campaign software. There's free account, free versions on almost all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally use MailerLite and I'm not I'm not an affiliate. This is not a paid commercial, but they do have the option to build landing pages inside of MailerLite that then are part of your email sequences. So Mm -hmm. if somebody were to sign up for your opt-in, it could take them directly to a landing page that you build in there. And that alleviates the need to like go into the back end of WordPress or Squarespace or show it and build a new website page. That's super helpful. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So fill, fill so, us in on this blog post. Like what are the what mistakes? <laughs> really, are really quickly, I want to come back um, and circle back because it will tie into um, the mistakes people make in their DIY yeah. design projects. Aaron mentioned something about page count and I want to encourage people. There is no end all be all page count. What matters more is that your content can breathe spatially so that as people scroll through, they don't feel like they've just read a novel. Instead, it feels like it's flowing. And even if it takes them 20 seconds to read a page and they keep scrolling and it's page 15, somebody doesn't feel overwhelmed because it just breathes and flows really well. So the very first mistake I'll mention is that people try to cram everything onto a page. They want their logo on every page. They want the page number on there. They want their like five paragraphs of content. And let's touch on that too. I'm a tangent person, apparently. (laughs) You are an expert, but you do not have to share every piece of expertise in your freebie. Mm -hmm. Like, please don't. You want to add a lot of value, but you also want somebody to hire you. So add a ton of value, but leave a little bit up in the air that somebody's like, okay, 
I wish I knew more, or I wish this person could tell me more about X, Y, Z. So, um, I like to leave one inch borders around all of my text in a document as just a general rule. And to be honest, I often leave more than that, but as somebody's going into like Canva or word document or whatever to create their opt-ins, um, I like to say, set it for a one inch border because that is going to give so much breathing room. And if Mm -hmm. your text doesn't fit, don't stress out, go to another page, let it flow to another page. It's fine. It does not mean that it's too long but still let it breathe. Don't do single space. If you're in word document, creating something, don't do single space. People won't read it. And now I want to also bring you to what else makes it breathe. And that is font size. If you're printing something in front of you and what we all learned this probably in middle school, high school, 12 point font is like the go-to online. It's very different. 12 point font is very small to read online. So I want to say 14 or 16 point is a better go-to, which means your content's going to fill the page a lot faster and that's okay. Let it flow to the next page. Always just add a page. And another thing that lets it flow and breathe is adding, um, I just based on the word, I have a client who calls it this and I love the term he uses, but a break, a break page. So if you have five points in between each point, have a page that's just like a picture for that symbolizes the industry and you're in, you know, if you're a nutrition coach, maybe it's somebody who's making food, you know, and just, you could have your logo on that page, or maybe you could have text overlaying it that says what point number two is that they're about to go into, but just, it just, breaks up the document a little bit. So it's not such a heavy lift to read it, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Sounds nice. So it's, yeah, it sounds very pl- uh, pleasing to the eye, almost like a magazine spread kind of thing. You're reading absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So the other, another thing um, that I'll be touching on in my blog post is having too many fonts. So fonts are awesome. And there's so many amazing fonts out there that it can be really tempting to be like, oh, this one's cute too. Oh, this one looks cool. Oh, this looks powerful. Like, you know, whatever is attracting you to a font. But I like to tell people to keep it to two to three fonts. And um, an easy way to hone it down is to identify a headline font, identify a subheading font, and identify a body text font. And then don't veer away from it. I mean, sometimes in your body, you might bold a section and that's different, but stick to that same font. And to clarify even further, sometimes your subheading font is just a bigger size of your body font. And that's fine. It doesn't have to be some scripty font or some like big blocky font. And But to have those three differentiators and then say, oh, this is a cool font. Oh, wait, it's not one of my three chosen fonts. So that's going to really help people look more professional and look like an expert if they're not just cluttering up with 15 fonts that they thought were cool the day that they got creative. <laughs> so, yeah. Can I share, because we talk about Canva a little bit here and there. So in Canva's brand, um, brand guide functionality that they have, you can do that. You can set your brand yes. fonts, your, your heading, your subheading, your body font. But I agonized. I'm like, okay, well, that that subheading font doesn't go with the heading. And the <laughs> heading is a serif font, so the subheading needs to be sans serif. I just invented all these dumb rules. I was like, th- these don't match each other. They don't complement each other. Like, So the fact that you just said, hey, your subheading font could just be your body text font, but bigger. Mm-hmm. So you have, you have one interesting heading font and then the rest of the fonts are just like normal fonts. Like, yeah, I, I, I feel like we can start spinning our wheels on crazy des- and Like you have a design background and m- many of us, we don't, we don't, but we're pretending that we do. We're trying to, we're trying to put on our graphic designer hat and try to figure out what's the most eye-catching complementary fonts and colors. Yes. And we could just really simplify it. Yeah. I love that you just put it that way because my blog post literally puts it that way. (laughs) Like, have you, how many hats are you wearing? Is one of them DIY design? (laughs) To me, it's like when people, we get new coaches who are starting their business. And the first thing they do is agonize for 10 months about their logo and their business card design. And it's like, no, this isn't, this is not action. I love that you say that because I, I get a lot of discovery calls come to me about their visual brand. They want a logo. They want their colors, their fonts, everything defined. And listen, that's what I do. And I love it. But some people come to me immediately after they've been certified for something or they've graduated college and they're like, I'm about to start my business. I tell those people, no, thank you. 
come back to me in six to 12 months Mm -hmm. because you just have to go out and do your business first, get the best, like, my husband is in tech. He calls an MVP, most viable product. Just start doing something. And then let's talk after you've started getting some clients about your visual brand, because as important as it is, and it, some designers might be wanting to punch me right now because I'm saying, hold off on design, but I, and I love design, but it's not as important as getting your message clear and starting to talk to your audience, because until you start getting clients, design is not as important. Yeah. yeah. Designing doesn't, your logo doesn't make you a coach. You're, yes. you're right. coaching. Exactly. So do what you have to do. Ask your brother's cousin or your brother's cousin, <laughs> your cousin, ask your, <laughs> your neighbor's kid, you know, whoever to get your logo set up, whatever you need to do. And then just start doing until you have the mental space to actually say, okay, it's time to visually show up like an expert that I already am. And now I'm going to address the visual side of my brand. Yeah. I mean, give yourself the grace to to baby step into your your business. You know, we we talk about this about how you know the average person graduates from a health coaching course somewhere between six to twelve months, right? Um, and you can be making money within six to twelve months. You're probably yes. not fully supporting yourself, but now you've got like a proof statement. Okay, someone's willing to pay me for get out and talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean, I moved down to to Florida two years ago. I, I, I finally have my website up, but I haven't skipped a beat in terms of getting, cause I just talk about it. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I got someone, Hey, I heard you are this coach. I need some help. And, blah, blah, and I don't have any, I mean, I got a website, but it's not the world's greatest. I'm still working on my brand and stuff. So let's get out there and get coaching and start talking to people. And the rest of that, you can, you can figure that out and then boom, you can kind of make a big splash and get out of the gate. Yeah. Um, in the right direction, right? Without having to go back and sort of redo everything. And it, that's probably a part of why it's taken me a little while to really get my butt in gear because I don't want to have to go back and redo it, you know? Yeah. Um, so but I'm doing it a little bit at a time. Just like on a health journey though, you you might go from point A to point B, but there's also point A, A.1, A.2, yeah. A.3. Yeah. So give your business the same flexibility that you would give a client on their health journey because your business is going to evolve. And every year you might think my brand needs to show up differently. And maybe your logo doesn't change every year. In fact, I hope it doesn't, Mm -hmm. but you might reevaluate the Canva templates you're using. You might reevaluate the opt-in that you're offering. You might reevaluate the type of blog posts you're putting out there. So Mm -hmm. give yourself the grace, both with your messaging and your visual brand to let it evolve as your business does, because you're going to learn more about yourself as a business owner, as a coach, you're going to learn more about what your clients need from you. And that's going to change your business as you continue to go down your journey. So we, I'm sure as, as health coaches, you guys are giving your clients so much grace. If somebody comes to you discouraged, you guys are pep talking them like crazy. Do the same for your business. Like if you are like, man, two years ago, I spent money on a logo and now I really hate it. And I just don't think it represents who my clients are your clients might've changed and Mm -hmm. be okay with saying, okay, I have the finances. I have the time. Let me invest in rebranding. And that's Mm -hmm. fine. Don't feel like, you know, that logo did not serve you well, even though right now you've grown out of it. If that makes sense. It does make sense. And I think that too, you know, this whole conversation we've had, which kind of was starting with like your web presence and this expert versus amateur look and feel and, the the logo and the logo never really factored into that. It's like, but your message did. The most important thing is your message, your call to action, your your yeah. the your freebie, that what you can mm-hmm. teach, what you offer, your value. Like we haven't even talked about the importance of a logo. It doesn't seem important. It's certainly not a oh, uh, worthy exercise to sp- spin your wheels on when you're when you're getting started. So yeah, and I mean. I will say a logo is important. I can't ever not say that a logo is important because I believe that it is, but I do think that it will not make or break the first year or two of your business. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to, it's not going to be the factor that does not get you clients because your logo is not up to par, you know? So, but it does definitely help you define the visual brand that you create. Yeah. There's something too, I've seen like every now and then in our, in our community, somebody will post their logo design they're working on. And it'll have a bicycle and an avocado and a tape measure. And then there's a tree and there's a sun and there's a moon. And it's like, I want this logo to, you know, I'm, I'm into fitness and I'm into nutrition. I'm really into circadian biology. And I want the logo to capture all that. And it's like, okay, on one hand, cool that you've been thinking through what your, what your coaching business encapsulates, encapsulates all these things. So I don't mind it. The, the logo 
sort of ideation exercise, if it helps a person to crystallize the things about their brand that they think are unique. It doesn't all have to show up in the logo though. Yeah. I love that you're touching on this. So I like to tell people like your logo does not represent your soul. (laughs) It just doesn't. And your logo needs to represent your clients and what you offer. So, um, you might love all these different factors that you're trying to cram into your logo, but does that mean that your business is about avocados? (laughs) I mean, so, so you really want to think through and try to really hold your logo loosely and maybe even let it go because it doesn't represent your soul. It doesn't mean that every piece of you needs to be in your logo. It needs to show up in a way that resonates with your clients, if that makes sense. Okay. And it's hard as a business owner, especially when you first start out, to disconnect who you are from who your business is. Maybe it's ne- maybe this is a thing. Maybe this is a new business owner exercise where it's like, okay, for internal use only, <laughs> design a logo that you think, like get out your crayons and put everything in this logo that you think, like basically draw a picture of your, maybe that's what it is. Maybe for some people, the visual representation of what they envision their business to be is a, is a really good imagination exercise to help them think through what their business will be. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to end up being then the client facing logo, but maybe this is just a good sort of just thought experiment to do visually. Yeah. You know, this leads me to, um, if you don't mind, I'd love to talk about my freebie because I do a part of um, helping you define your brand style. And that's a lot of what you were just talking about. Um, In my freebie, it's about setting up Canva to um, save you time so that you're not scrolling Canva like it's social media trying to find the next cool template. I want people to be able to have templates ready to go for their brand specifically so that they don't have to scroll the templates that Canva provides anymore. They can just go to their brand templates, do their post, export it, get the post done and and be done instead of spending. I've heard people spend two hours searching the, for the perfect template on Canva. And I said, what kind of clients could you have signed in that time? What mm-hmm. other content could you have created in that time? There's just so many other things that you should be doing in your business that you probably would prefer to be doing in your business, but you just get sucked into Canva scrolling. So one of the things that I have people do is to scroll. So set a timer for 30 to 60 minutes. You decide how much time you have and just scroll Canva templates and open in a new tab every time you see one that you feel could represent your business well. And you might have 10 tabs. You might have 50 tabs. I mean, everyone's different, but open in a new tab until your timer goes off and then close the scroll. Only have open the individual ones that you had opened in tabs after your timer goes off and then take out a piece of paper or your digital note taking, whatever you do and write down the commonalities behind everything that you opened. Is it super, you know, earthy tones? Does it feel really, um, peppy? Does it feel really retro? Does it feel like very vibrant? Does it feel sophisticated or casual? Does it feel bold or, you know, refreshing, you know, so write down all the things that you find in common with these. Do you see a ton of circles or do you only see straight edges? Do you see a ton of diagonal lines or is everything straight? You know, write down all the commonalities that you see, and you're going to help yourself define your brand style a lot more easily. Now that you have all these jumping off points that other designers have designed and you didn't have to like think up on your own, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, try to hone that list. That list might be super long. It might be super short. Everyone makes lists differently, but try to hone it down to about five or six things. And that's going to help you create the templates that you actually can use going forward. So it might be one or two things. You could start from scratch and just have a white template and um, create based on the factors that you've just defined in your brand style. Or maybe you fell in love with one of the ones that you had open and you use that as a starting point and you create your templates based on that one that you've opened. And that could, and I encourage people to do multiple things, create Instagram templates, create real covers, create um, Pinterest um, graphics, create blog post graphics, which are often the same as your Pinterest graphics, Mm -hmm. Um, create anything that you might use. Go ahead and set all of your um, style definition aside, get a new piece of paper or a new note and write down all the types of posts you do. Do you do motivation Monday? do a template for that. Do you do health tip Tuesday? 
do a template for that. You know, are you constantly posting blog post features that you've been on or new episodes of your own blog? Do a template for that. Are you doing only reels? Maybe do like four different variations of covers, you know, so things like that. Make a list of every type of post that you might do. Do you post client testimonials? Make a template for that. So then come back to your style, come back to the one that you decided that you want to use as your base template, and then modify that for all of the things on your list of the types of posts that you want to do. Because now all of a sudden posting on social media just got way faster. Mm -hmm. You see an email from a client that says an amazing testimonial. You can copy it, go to Canva, paste it in. And all of a sudden you have a blog post in five minutes or less. So I, I think that I hate to see people waste time in Canva, but as a designer, I fully accept that Canva is a tool people use. People don't need to hire me to make all their social media graphics. They can do it themselves as long as they're set up for success and they're not setting themselves up to have this be just a huge time suck for them. If that, I feel like I say, if that makes sense a lot to you guys. Makes a ton of sense for somebody (laughs) who really like just Canva. I've done very little in there. I don't really know how to use it well. So that was really helpful for me. You know, I have an account, I use it occasionally, but I really don't, I really don't know all the tools. I don't really know how to use it well. Aaron's really good at it. Um, So for me, it's a time suck for Aaron. I'm sure it's a time saver because she's better at that stuff than I am. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but, but the idea of having go-to templates for certain things makes, mm-hmm. makes a ton of sense. So far, the only yeah. thing is here's my logo and these are the colors I use. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one think- more thing. If you're just starting out in business and you don't know what type of posts you're going to be posting, right. I'd say, choose one social media platform. Don't dive into all of them. Choose one and then find accounts. Maybe you already have accounts that you follow that are inspirational to you in your industry or even in other people's industry. Maybe you follow a painting coach or an, a, you know, a sports coach or whatever, and you like the type of posts that they do. Let that steer you to make your list of the type of posts that you want to be making templates for. Because sometimes when we just start out, we're like, I don't know what I'm going to post. And it doesn't occur to us to post a testimonial or a motivational quote or, you know, five tips for whatever, you know, so go ahead and find the accounts that you love, whether they're in your industry or not, and let that kind of be your fuel for what types of posts you can be creating. This is great. I think this is just a really good... um getting your wheels in motion sort of activity as well. Like, okay, you're a new coach. You're going to need some templates. So let's just, let's just do that. You know, here's your assignment, scroll Canva for an hour, find looks and feels that you like, you know, start imagining the kind of content you could create. I I think that's, I think that's really productive, productive use of time. Rather than scrolling Instagram for an hour, scroll Mm -hmm. Canva for an hour. At least it's productive time. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that I'm the opposite. I open Canva, whichever one is, whichever one Canva serves up in the top left corner. I'm like, good, we'll take that one. Like I'm the <laughs> worst. I don't, <laughs> I don't even scroll. I think this is a good activity for somebody like me to just like really, you know, dive into Canva's templates instead of just taking the the first, the first ones that are served up. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, there's just so many things we could honestly ask you about. Like we could seriously pick your brain for so many more hours. Cause I love how we're getting into like small, small things here. And I, um, that might be just my own bias because I'm not a strategy thinker. I'm a tactics thinker, but I think a lot of people who are coming into health coaching and entrepreneurship kind of maybe are that way too. So it's, it's nice to, to think about the small little tactics that shore up eventually to a bigger business strategy. But like for a lot of folks, sitting down to write their business plan, their 10 year plan is so, so far out of their reach that focusing on some of these very, very actionable, productive behaviors, I think feels like a good, like you're making, you're getting some traction. So I've yeah. really enjoyed every, I could ask you a hundred more questions, but a hundred more tiny things, but honestly, we would just be here for hours. If you do have a couple more minutes, I'd love to circle back to messaging for just a second. Mm-hmm. Do you have the time? Ooh. So I'd love to just talk about clarifying our message. Cause that is so vague to just say the words, clarify your message. And if I did not have the story of brand framework, I'd be like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted to walk through exactly what are the seven parts of the framework that I use so that people can understand what I mean by clarifying your message. Um, so the first one we kind of talked about an aspirational identity is something that you want to define. So I want you to define 
um, who they are now and who they're going to become after they work with you, kind of that client journey that you're bringing them on and who that they become after they work with you. We call that an aspirational identity in the story brand framework. And that's not the that's not one of the parts of the seven frames, but it influences all seven parts of the, of the framework. So after you've defined your aspirational identity in the framework, we also define what does our person want? What does our client want? We call them a character because in the story brand framework, we're writing a story for our marketing. So what does your character want? This is the hero of your story. And if you think about a movie, the heroes in those movies, they're not the smartest cookie in the box. So a lot of times as a company, we want to position ourselves as the hero. Look at all these amazing things that I do for you, but you are not the hero. You are the expert. And I'll get to that in just a minute. So we want to define what does our hero want? And the hero is your customer, your client. Then we define the problems that they're solving. And we do that in three ways. We define an external problem that they're solving because people shop based on their external problems. Mm -hmm. We want to define an internal problem that they're solving because people buy based on solving an internal problem, Mm -hmm. even if they shopped for an external one. Mm -hmm. And then we want to define a philosophical problem. Why is it just awful that somebody has to face the external and the internal problems and define what why that's so terrible. And sometimes that feels repetitive to what your external and internal problems are, but um, it has a lot of power. Um, and then after we've defined what they want, what their problem is, then we want to set ourselves up to be a guide. A guide enters into the story after we've heard the hero's problem. And you as a business owner, as a coach, you are the guide. You're going to guide them through their journey into the aspirational identity that you have defined. So it's easy for us to take that front seat, be the hero, but we want to actually be in the back seat or in the passenger seat, guiding them where they want to go. And it sets us up to be way more authoritative in what we're doing. We have that trust factor build way higher if we are the person handholding someone else than if we're the person who needs our hand to be held. And so we do that through a couple of ways. We define um, how we show empathy for a client. I like to call these been there, done that statements. And then we define our authoritative pieces, which is things like our certifications, how many um, years we've been in business is one that people like to do a lot that I try to avoid because it's so common. Um, How many clients we've served or even, or even just part of like, the fact that you talk to people every day who are facing the same problem as the person who is looking into your industry, that's authority. The fact that you talk to so many people just like me, that matters to me. So then after we have that um, guide definition for ourselves, we want to set them up with a plan. We want to make three steps really easy for them to do business with us. This is oftentimes the first step is your call to action. Schedule a call is the first step. You know, make a plan might be the second step. And the third one is some sort of success, like achieve your health goals. It can be really simple steps. And maybe the process in working with us is way more complicated, but we want to make it seem really easy because if I come up to a roaring river and there's no bridge, I don't understand how to get to the other side. But if somebody lays three huge boulders in the, in the raging river and I can go bloop, 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 to the next side, I'm so much more likely to go ahead and click my call to action and go across the river because I have those stepping stones. And then we define our calls to action, which we've already talked about having a direct one that's very actionable and an indirect one, which I call the transitional, that opt-in, that way to get an email address. We also define buckets of success. What does it look like to be successful or paint that promised land of what it's like after we've worked with you or to work with you? And failure. And this is where people get held up a lot. They don't want to be negative in their marketing. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about this in terms of baking. Failure is like your salt. You sprinkle it in. Everybody needs it in their recipe. But success is like your flour. You need heaps and heaps of it. And so we cannot avoid having failure in our marketing, but we don't want to fear monger. We don't want to belittle or anything like that. But what does it look like if you didn't hire me as a coach, you know, what does it look like if you continue down the health journey you're already on, or if you continue to ignore your health or whatever that means for you. So those are the seven parts of the framework that I walk people through in order to clarify their message. And I thought that was really important to outline because I know that if I heard somebody say, clarify your message, I would be like, what, what? (laughs) And so I wanted to make sure people had some anchor points that they could use in order to do that. I think sometimes when people hear clarify their messages, and this is something we talk about, they, they think they've got to get it all down to like a, my elevator pitch, 
you know, and I'm like, like, like the whole purpose of an elevator pitch is for you to learn to be succinct, but nobody wants to be pitched anything in an elevator. Let's be clear about that. Right. You know, how can you, in a very distinct manner, create a sense of curiosity in your client that that, where they might want to ask more, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's an exercise worth going through, but to your point, clarifying your message, yours sounds like a journey to me. I mean, a story, absolutely. It's got a, 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 a beginning, a middle and an end, the sort of like at the end of the day, here's all the wonderful things that happen when you work with me. Or you can go this road <laughs> and yeah. not have those wonderful things, you know, but how do I get there? You know? Yeah. So I, I love that framework and it's, um, gosh, I, and, and I just think so many coaches when they try to get started, they're just out there trying to sell health coaching and it's very vague and there's no real mention there about what it is they really do and what problem they're solving. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah. Well, I think with the most exciting thing that, that I wrote down, I was jotting that down really quickly mm-hmm. as you're talking. Um, you said, define the problem. The external problem is how people shop yep. and the internal problem is how people buy. So this is the old health coaching. I mm-hmm. sell gut health thing. I sell gut health. I, you know, <laughs> no one's shopping for gut health. Mm-hmm. So, so I just think that's really interesting because I, I do think that, and we, cause we care so much as health coaches, we want people to feel a certain way and have this experience in their body, but that's not how people shop. They're not Googling mm-hmm. that. Yeah. 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 I'm so glad that was helpful. I'm so glad. Yeah. And so true. When you think through, um, you know, people go out and buy a new car, you know, and they've got this, this aspirational, they, they, there's this, this external thing at the end of the day that they're looking that that's driving them to go do that. But what they actually decide on is something that's far more internal to the way they actually live their life yeah. and you know, what they're looking for. Exactly. Yeah. And I just finished um, coaching a group through this framework yesterday and we did a two day workshop together and I'm actually about to launch this monthly um, small group coaching where it's a uh, maximum five people per month. And I'm going to walk them through the framework together. It's about a quarter of the cost of what I charge one-on-one clients. And I just, I'm doing this because I really want more health and wellness coaches to be able to get clear on their messaging because the more people that can get clear, the more they're going to talk to their actual audience and not just be vague. Because if you sell to everyone, you're selling to nobody. Yeah. And we want you to be able to get that need niche market that you're actually trying to talk to. And so I'm trying to find a way to really make what I do affordable to anybody if they're just starting out even. So um, I'm excited to be able to do that because it's just so needed. Like I said, I shopped around for so long feeling like everyone was an amateur Mm -hmm. and then finally realizing, Oh my goodness, how many experts did I pass up? (laughs) So, yeah. So where can people find out more about that? Find out where can they find you? Yeah. So at this point, because I'm just starting it out, I'm going to do a little bit of pre-screening as people come in. So they can just come to Naomi G backs.com backslash 15 and book a 15 minute call for me. And we'll just make sure we're a good fit to be in the coaching together. Um, and that is N A O M I G E E. My last name is G. So it's actually spelled out in my URL. So, um, and I'm sure I can provide that link for your show notes as well. Awesome. Yeah. It's great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Naomi. This is awesome. Absolutely. This so fun. Thank you so much, Naomi. Absolutely. I hope people got a lot of value. I think so. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.